So could you talk to us about essentially in a kind of mini version <laughs> the role of hormones so essentially when they start to deplete we often hear particularly people like yourself specialists talk about hormone receptors so where do we have them do we have them for all three hormones so estrogen progesterone and testosterone and what's the effect of them depleting so uh, um so hormones play a very important part of course this discussion we're all talking about talking about the menopause and menopausal symptoms but of course hormones play a far bigger part uh, where do we have them almost everywhere if you want to look at it that way so of course they play an important part i mean if you look at estrogen estrogen uh, receptors are almost almost all connective tissue in the body if you look at it so uh, you could look at it from you know the brain to skin to bone to to muscle F, really the vaginal tissue, yeah. all different aspects. Now, of course, when you look at it and say, if you go back to teenage years and menarche and when, when a, a girl starts her, her you know, menstrual cycles, all the secondary sexual characteristics are secondary to, to estrogen. So you could say the ovary serves a hormonal function and a reproductive function. Mm -hmm. So you've got the eggs in the small sacs called the follicles. The eggs, of course, serve the reproductive function, the hormones, as a teenager will serve the, uh, uh, the secondary sexual characteristics aspect of things, but maintain reproductive health and well-being throughout, throughout life, really. So if you look at it, if you take women under the age of 50, if you look at the risk of cardiovascular disease, it's significantly lower in men, and that's a protective effect of estrogen. That cardiovascular protective effect continues onwards, even beyond the menopause. So if someone starts HRT at 50, 51, they are giving themselves a significant reduction in cardiovascular the risk of cardiovascular disease. If you look at the risk of cardiovascular disease after 50, it gradually increases as a result of the drop in estrogen. And by the time a woman enters her 70s and her 80s, the risk of cardiovascular disease equals that in men. And that just shows you how kind of okay. powerful that effect from an estrogen point of view. Yeah. If you look at bone, again, very important protective role. And we see it in the context of two groups. In the younger, if we talk about the reproductive years, we see it in women with premature ovarian insufficiency yep. who are estrogen deficient because their ovaries have, they've got low numbers of eggs. But we also see it in patients with what's called hypothalamic amenorrhea, where their ovaries have got reasonable numbers of eggs, but because either their exercise or their weight is really low, their ovaries switch off, ovulation switches off, and their estrogen levels are low. And they have all the manifestations that you see in someone who has got an early menopause from a hormonal okay. point of view. And we see many of these young, younger women and young women who exercise well a lot, exercise a lot and healthy, who've got osteoporosis. So what, and people, when we talk about these risks, people often think it's a long-term risk. Actually, these are not that long-term. They are tangible. They're in the near future of these mm -hmm. effects. Um, uh, estrogen is also important for brain health. So if you look at, at women under the age of 50, uh, uh, you do look at the data on, on women with early surgical menopause and premature ovarian insufficiency, that there is an increased longer term risk of, of dementia in that group if they don't receive HRT. Right. And we've got good data that estrogen replacement under the age of 50 protects against that effect. Now, of course, that argument when you go beyond 50 is slightly different. So when you talk about does, how do we, and maybe we could cover that later on, but if you look at how you translate that, the bone protective effect continues. So if you are, you know, someone's got premature ovarian insufficiency at 30, HRT will protect against osteoporosis. And if you've got osteoporosis and you're 50 and you're menopausal, HRT will protect and treat osteoporosis, and that'll be a lifelong effect. Right. Cardiovascular effect often is, is ongoing if you start HRT in the right window. Which is what, which is what, which what is, is that window? Early 50. So, so within, so, I mean, people refer to within 10 years, but the 10 year window is really purely how the studies were designed. But if you yeah. think about it, it's more almost like you're talking about not having a big gap between your natural estrogen and where HRT comes in. So the earlier, the better. The earlier, the better from a cardiovascular point of view, because you're maintaining that, you know, effect on on the uh, endothelial vessel endothelia the muscle in the in the vessels and the risk of atherosclerosis mm -hmm. now cognitive effect is slightly different in that when you look at the role of hrt beyond the age of 50 
the collective evidence suggests it's a neutral effect. So but when you start talking about, and of course, what, but, but the point that I would say that we should differentiate is between symptoms related to estrogen deficiency. So when you talk about brain fog, memory, concentration, mm -hmm. and also low mood anxiety, these are estrogen deficiency symptoms. They're not signs of cognitive impairment. These are very common menopausal symptoms and estrogen is incredibly effective in reversing them. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about cognitive impairment and decline, in other words, dementia and yeah. Alzheimer's yeah. disease, that's where you would say the collective evidence suggests that beyond 50, HRT doesn't increase the risk, but doesn't lower the risk either. Right. So you would say if you're 51, 52 and taking HRT, I would say to you, if we talk about, if you say to me, how, what would it do to my risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? The collective evidence that we have now will say it would be a neutral effect from that right. point of view. Right, okay. And there's there's quite a lot of research going on in that area at the moment, yeah, there isn't is, there? There's plenty of research. There's been one or two confusing in a way, <laughs> In studies that have shown a potential have referred to a potential increase in risk and and again if you may remember two years ago in the british medical journal there was a study suggested a potential increase risk but when you look at the study design there were limitations with it and i would say if you put it together with the body of evidence that we've got from other studies collectively you would say i don't think we've got good evidence to say that it'll increase the risk it's a neutral effect from a risk of developing from developing dementia yeah. So can we talk while we're kind of talking brain, <laughs> can we talk about what actually happens as as the estrogen levels fluctuate and then deplete? Because for so many people, you will see this all the time in your clinic. For so many people, the first symptoms are things like anxiety, low mood, um, perhaps they're struggling with their confidence, etc. Mood swings what is what's actually going on so it's 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 the effect of so as we were referring earlier on the receptors are present in various parts and not only affecting the connective tissue within the brain which can have a, a certain impact but also the neurotransmitters within the brain and the effect is not as such from low estrogen but it's from chronic low estrogen because if right. you think about it in a normal menstrual cycle estrogen levels are very low at the beginning yeah and then they're very high mid-cycle, and then they come down in the latter part of the cycle. But in a typical cycle, you don't experience menopausal symptoms, generally speaking, for the majority. It's the chronic deficiency that has the effect. And you can say, if you say, why do women get symptoms? Of course, it's, it's a multi, it's a multifactorial. So you could say, from hot flushes at night sweats, it's the effect of that chronic depletion on the what's called the thermoregulatory centers in the brain. So the temperature control centers. So it's almost like if you look at, if you're premenopausal, you've got a bit of a wider range for you to start detecting changes that your body reacts to by getting feeling hot or sweating. If you think about it, it's more your reaction to, to, to the temperature around you to say yep. you need to sweat or you need to get hot or, or so that change. That range narrows so you become more sensitive to it and that's why you get the hot flushes and the night sweats mm -hmm. now the other symptoms are more to do with the different centers in the in the in the in the brain so if you look right. at the neurotransmitters can be affected the 5-ht there are lots of data that suggest that and if you look at management of depression a lot of the medications work along these pathways mm -hmm. and that may explain the changes in anxiety in mood many of the symptoms that people experience. The sexual arousal centers in the brain, that's where you would say the effect of the chronic deficiency on will, will affect that. So it's that multiple effect on these various centers as to why you know people can experience these symptoms. But of course, you would still say, I mean, when you look at the, the prevalence of symptoms, it's not everyone will experience symptoms as you're aware. So you would look at it and say, you could say 10 to 20% of, of women go through the menopause without having symptoms. Do we you know, know why that is? So there's no, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's that your, your brain is not reacting in the same way. Right. And you could say the same argument applies to how long you have the symptoms. Yep. You know, yep. why, would, why would one individual have symptoms? I mean, if you look at the average duration of menopausal symptoms, it's seven years. Mm -hmm. One in three women have long-term symptoms. I think that number is often not quoted often enough. 
you often see that, oh that's so say, true that's uh, that's so true you often see people who would say you know i thought i'll wait i i my heart sinks when i see someone who's 61 62 who says i've never touched hrt and i've had these symptoms for the last 10 years and you think how awful is it for someone to go through 10 years of not well needing to suffer with this and yeah. not knowing that there is an answer for yeah. it thinking yeah. well it'll go so of course going back to your question why does not why does why would why do some women not experience them it's the, the different variations between different people same thing with the symptoms you would say why would you know someone have symptoms for six months or nine months and someone have them for 20 years or 30 years i mean we see many patients in their 70s and their 80s we, we, you see patients who are in their 90s who HRT has made a difference to their lives and they're happy on it. And for them, that's the right thing to, to continue. That's why you would always say one should not set any arbitrary limits to how long you can take HRT for. We see many people who will say, oh, I've been told I'm going to become 60, I'm going to become 65, I should come off it. The answer is it should be individualized on what your needs are. And if, if for you as an individual is giving you the benefits that you need and, and the balance of benefits risk is discussed, it's perfectly reasonable to continue for, for, for what you need it for. And if you need to use it long term, then that's, that is reasonable. But of course, that discussion need to be informed to go through, you know, both aspects. And, and, and yeah, if that's the right thing to do, that'll be, you know, the, the suggestion is to say that it's fine to continue.